Today at Yom Kippur is uh, a time for us here in America to, well, those of us who found our way here into the synagogue in Israel, uh, Yom Kippur is a complete and utter shutdown. It's, uh, there's no traffic on the roads. Every store, every restaurant is closed. Israelis, most of them even stop smoking for a day. Um, <laughs> Where buses usually go down, there's uh, kids walking around, bikes, kids on bikes, on uh, skateboards. Um, whether it's a religious community or a secular neighborhood, doesn't matter. There's nothing going on on Yom Kippur. For 24, 24 25 hours, nothing. Well, 50 years ago today, that stillness of Yom Kippur was shattered by war. Defense Minister Moshe Dayan, the general and hero of Israel, proclaimed to Golda Meir that day that the third Jewish commonwealth may be destroyed. The first one fell in 586 to the Babylonians and the second to the Romans in 70, the Common Era. And the modern Jewish state that was only established 25 years earlier was at risk of falling to the Egyptian and Syrian armies. And he warned the elderly and, as we now know, very sick Prime Minister that at the start of Yom Kippur there were 450 Israeli infantrymen, 300 tanks, and only 50 artillery pieces facing 100,000 Egyptian soldiers. On the Golan, there were only two Israeli infantry regiments, uh, and they were looking at 45,000 Syrian troops and 1,100 tanks. Two-thirds of Israel's soldiers were home with their families for Yom Kippur, far away from their guns and from their tanks and from their planes. And Golda Meir was forced to decide between a general staff that had been internally at odds over whether Egypt and Syria were building up troops and amassing artillery as a lead-up to invasion or as standard maneuvers. And this game had been going on for months. Just five months earlier, there was a troop buildup, and Israel responded by calling up the reserves, and it cost Israel $35 million to do that. And they couldn't afford to do that every time they saw this buildup. This is covered in the new Golda movie, this situation that went on amongst her cabinet. But on that Yom Kippur 50 years ago, from the air, from the sea, and from the land, 10,000 shells rained down on Israel in the first minute of the war. And the movie tries to capture this, but the people who survived it, the few soldiers in the Golan that saw this with their own eyes. The stream of Syrian tanks that kept coming across the Golan as the battalions there were running out of ammunition. The Israelis, as we know, were able to turn the tide of the war and once again routing their enemies. But the losses were catastrophic. In Israel, the almost 3,000 people who died during the war, per capita, that was like three times the losses of Vietnam in the United States around the same time. Now, Golda is much more popular in America than she is in Israel. In Israel, you can go to Rabin Square or Har Herzl or Ben Gurion University or Weizmann Institute. You can travel on Begin Road down through Tel Aviv and Golda Meir has a square in New York City on 39th Street in Manhattan. A public school is named for her in Milwaukee. But Israelis are noticeably understated about Golda. She bore the brunt of the Yom Kippur War, and even though she survived an inquiry that immediately came after the war to try to find out what happened, who was responsible, 
She's borne the responsibility for the catastrophes of Yom Kippur. And that's what primarily the movie with Helen Mirren starring as Gold is all about. So by the way, it's available now. You can stream it. It's already available on YouTube and Apple and different, uh, I think Amazon has it as well. You can rent it. And uh, you don't have to see the movie. It's been documented. It's in history books. It's in other documentaries. Most of Israel's military, the generals, thought that an Arab invasion was impossible. After the stunning victory of, of 67, of the Six-Day War, just a few years earlier, remember, it was only six years before, the sentiment was that Israel had defeated their enemies, had crushed them so badly, humiliated them. How could they possibly raise up arms against a clearly superior Israel defense force? An army and air force that in just 132 hours, one of the shortest wars in recorded history, destroyed billions of dollars of Arab weapons, hundreds and hundreds of tanks, and downed nearly 500 aircraft. Israel emerged from the Six-Day War with a casualty rate of 25 to 1 in its favor. The IDF in 67 was within sight of Damascus, Amman, and Cairo, and Israel conquered 42,000 square miles of territory, three and a half times its original size. Jerusalem was once again reunited, and Aliyah surged to Israel. Israel felt confident, strong. Who could have predicted that the Arabs would invade again? Certainly not the overconfident generals that surrounded Golda. On Yom Kippur, every Yom Kippur, we come before God not with boasting and not with bragging, but with the simple truth that we are helpless. We are mortal, we are frail, and fallible human beings. In a moment, we're going to hear the Unatana Tokef prayer. We say, who will live and who will die? Who in the fullness of years and who before the fullness of years, who by fire and who by water, who by earthquake and who by plague, who by sword and who by wild beast. And you can't get much more honest, and you can't get much more humble than that. The point of this prayer, very simply, is that we're not captains of our own fate. We're not in complete control of our lives. Like it or not, we're not all-powerful. This is the premise of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. That we're not as powerful as we like to think we are. We're going to have to stop bragging and boasting and pretending that we're all wise, all powerful, all strong. And that's why we also, today, have the ability to do the Korim on Yom Kippur, where we don't just lower our heads and bow, where we come to Alenu, but we kneel and we bow and we go down all the way. We prostrate ourselves, we fall on our faces in order to remind ourselves and show before God that we're human. And that's one of the first lessons that the Yom Kippur War taught us as well. And it's, of course, the lesson of every Yom Kippur. Don't be overconfident. Sense of humility is necessary to function in this world. There's a movie that came out a few years ago that also had reference to the Yom Kippur War. It's, uh, it's one of my favorite discussions of the Yom Kippur War because it was made for the general public and had nothing to do with history. It was imagination. It was World War Z. We hope it's imagination. They're actually uh, based on, on books. World War Z was based on uh, books by Max Brooks. I don't know if you know who Max Brooks is. He's actually Mel Brooks' son, and Anne Bancroft, a blessed memory son. Now, Mel Brooks, as we know, is, is one of our Jewish legends, and thank God he's still going strong, too. 
Uh, Anne Bancroft uh, was, very, was very Italian. She didn't have an Italian last name. She changed her name, but very, uh, very Italian. He actually was talking about his background a few years ago on, on Fresh Air. He told Terry Gross, um, friends would often say, you're not really Jewish because of your mom. And I would tell them, I may not be Jewish enough for you, but I'm Jewish enough for Dachau. And that pretty much shut them up. And he also told her, you better not say anything anti-Semitic around me because then I go full Jew. <laughs> now, he is actually very proud of his, of his Jewish identity, and he's, uh, he's a talented writer and, and uh, entertainer in, in, his own, in his own right. And in the movie that was made, which he helped write, uh, Brad Pitt's character, if you recall, goes to Israel to find out how Israel was prepared for the zombies. And he meets with a character, the Israeli uh, head of security. The character's name is Warmbrum. He's the head of this, the uh, response to the zombies. And so he asks him, how did, how did you know? How did you prepare? And this is what he said. In the 30s, the Jews refused to believe they would be sent to concentration camps. In 72, we refused to fathom we'd be massacred in the Olympics. In the month before October of 1973, we saw Arab troop movements, and we unanimously agreed that, we, that they didn't pose a threat. Well, a month later, the Arab attack almost drove us into the sea. So we decided to make a change. And Warmbrun goes on to explain the 10th man. If nine of us with the same information arrived at the exact same conclusion, it's the duty of the 10th man to disagree. No matter how improbable it may seem, the 10th man has to start thinking with the assumption that the other nine were wrong. Since everyone assumed that this talk of zombies was cover for something else, I have began my investigation on that assumption that when they said zombies, they meant zombies. And by the way, because of that scene, the film was seen as pro-Israel propaganda and several countries wouldn't even show the movie. Now, Israel is known as a startup nation now, a country that leads the world in innovation. And innovation requires thinking outside the box and questioning established views, imagining alternatives. It's not easy, but it is financially rewarding. It's why countries like the UAE, like the Emirates, and so many former enemies are lining up to get in with Israel and to be a part of that growth and that success. Israel has learned you don't believe the easy answer. Now, it's easy to, but it's lazy and it's dangerous. And Israel is a country that encourages debate at its basic level, at its earliest level. People who go to Israel to observe schools there are astounded. They're, they're somewhat discomforted because they see the kids don't seem to um, be as respectful to the teachers. They challenge the teachers a lot. Well, in the Israeli military, which we know is a well-regarded military, it's the same situation. They actually encourage soldiers to challenge their officers. It's a much different situation in Israel. Israelis seem to argue all the time, even when they're agreeing with each other and you don't understand Hebrew, it seems like they're arguing. On Rosh Hashanah, I told you the story <clears throat> of how Golda Meir raised $30 million in 1948 for the new nation of Israel. She came here and uh, fundraised here in the place that she was raised. Well, 25 years later, now as Prime Minister of the United States, and to thank the United States for the amazing aid that it provided to Israel during the Yom Kippur War, which is also in the movie and is well documented, and I was just talking to Reverend Andy here who shared with me that one of the people who came here to worship in the congregation, he was speaking about Yom Kippur War because he's a, he's a guy who also thinks outside the box and has no problem recognizing again what we can learn from these situations. And this American uh, a Christian came up to him, 
in church and, and told him after the service that he was one of those Americans that helped deliver supplies to Israel. It's amazing. I'd like to meet that person, by the way. Thank him. So Golda came back here in 73, now as prime minister. And she met with President Nixon, who was uh, in 1973 going through his own challenges. Now, Henry Kissinger was the Secretary of State at the time. And what was interesting is Kissinger had only become Secretary of State. People forget this. He became Secretary of State like two weeks before the Yom Kippur War started. That was his like, first thing he had to do. And of course, he was in a very difficult situation being a Jew and being a, a survivor. His, he lost several family members during the Shoah. And they had this uh, official reception at the White House. And during the reception, Nixon, who we know was a little bit of an anti-Semite himself, but wanted to brag to Golda, he said, Madam Prime Minister, it must be a source of great satisfaction to you to know that the United States, and here in our country, Jews are so well regarded and are given so much political equality that in my administration, a Jew serves as my Secretary of State, your equivalent of a foreign minister. And Golda responded, I'm sure that you will be delighted to know, Mr. President, that our foreign minister is also a Jew <laughs> who differs in one respect from your foreign minister. Now, at the time, Israel's foreign minister was a man named Abba Iban, who was born in South Africa, went to Cambridge, spoke like a Cambridge don, actually was a Cambridge professor. And Golda looked at Nixon and Kissinger and said, our foreign minister, Abba Iban, speaks English without an accent. <laughs> Israel has long been able to send native speaking ambassadors to any country because they have people who are born in every nation. Every nation where Jews have gathered from around the world to come to Israel. And so Israel is a land of amazing diversity, bringing the rich gifts of every corner of the world to this tiny outpost in the Middle East. This is one of the many realities that drives a wedge between Israel and its largely homogenous Arab Middle East neighbors. It's one of Israel's strengths. It's also a challenge because the people have very different cultural experiences and it leads to further disagreements and challenges but it also has vibrant diversity and insight. And it's an immigrant diversity that's one of the strongest factors that unites Israel and the United States, because it's something we have here too. But we have to ask the question, can it happen here? And I don't have to say what it is. It's not likely, but we have to ask ourselves. At Charlottesville, we heard people marching with torches and saying, Jews will not replace us. This summer, nine congresspeople couldn't bring themselves to stay that, say that Israel is a country deserving of U.S. support. Not money, mind you, just a vote of support. A resolution that Israel is not, this is quote, not a racist and apartheid state and further condemned anti-Semitism. The one democracy in the Middle East, the one country that consistently stands with the United States. And these nine members of Congress, who have already been elected and re-elected to Congress, publicly voted against it. Is it possible? Well, our sister synagogue, Beth Shalom, as you know, was shut down last week at Rosh Hashanah, turning at least some of our holidays, some of us here in Santa Clarita, into days of fear and sadness in our city, in our community. Now, the cowards who perpetrated this are representative of, of a greater trend. It happened, uh, by the way, that same cowardly act was done over 50 times across the country in the last two months to synagogues. 
And so this is really this last lesson from the Yom Kippur War. Not to be overconfident. To ask questions and to challenge. But for 2,000 years, we Jews cowered in the darkness, hoping that violence against us would end. And it never did. Now there's a scene in Fiddler on the Roof, and I'm looking back at Andy right now because he did an amazing job of it, but I don't know. And I, uh, Maybe you'll ask him or I'll ask him in, in depth what it meant, how he felt doing this. But that scene in Fiddler on the Roof when the end of uh, Act 1 where the wedding is bo- broken up by a pogrom. And they can do nothing. Tevya and the family just have to watch this. <clears throat> the, Holocaust, the Holocaust taught us that no amount of success, no amount of assimilation, no level of education would save you. There was no way to hide. Only by protecting ourselves, making sure we had the means to fight back. The last time, 50 years ago, that Israel was attacked by an army, by nations, was on Yom Kippur in 1973. Now Israel, as we know, has not enjoyed much peace. Hezbollah and Hamas and terrorists and rockets, it's part of Israel's existence. But none of its neighbors, not even the combined strength of all of its neighbors, would engage in a battle with Israel for the last 50 years. Yom Kippur was a very strange war. It's perceived in the Arab world as a victory and in Israel as a loss. Israel crossed over the Suez Canal and was 60 miles from Cairo in 1973, 20 miles from Damascus. They drove further into those countries than they did in Six-Day War. It's shown in the Golden Movie. I mean, you can, it's history. You can look on a map and see how far Israel went in 1973. And it's also in the movie that Israel had completely surrounded Egypt's third army. 30,000 soldiers were at the mercy of Golda Meir. And she literally, and her and her generals, had to decide, do we destroy this army right now? Because that way they'll never come back. But they didn't. They decided to negotiate, and eventually that led to Camp David Accords, where, of course, Israel gave back the Sinai to Egypt. And for that, Egypt sees it as a victory. I couldn't understand this. When I went to Egypt in 1989, I drove across the October 6th Victory Bridge in Cairo. A victory bridge. But for Israel, Israelis continue to see it as a devastation because of the soldiers and the people that were lost. Now, it tells you that there's still a lot of work we have to do to help create real peace. Because I read And you'll see there's going to be discussion about it next week for the 50th anniversary on the secular calendar at beginning of October. Literally, you're going to see stuff maybe in the news. And if you really want to, if you want to see it, go on Al Jazeera, go on Al Akram, go on the Arab news sources that are going to be celebrating the 50th anniversary of this, this victory. But this is the lesson from us, for all of us on Yom Kippur. If those who would victimize us, see us as victims, we will be victims. 
and not just on a national level or an ethnic level, but individually in the lives we live every day. That doesn't mean you walk around looking for a fight. We love peace. But when we're confronted by people who would harm us, we can't run away, and we can't take a beating hoping that it will end. But that will be the end of it. 2,000 years of Jewish history have taught us better. We will be prepared. We won't be overconfident. Which is, by the way, why we today have two plainclothes officers walking around this building right now. Today, as we celebrate a reborn Israel, a nation that has its challenges, but a nation that 50 years ago, on the holiest day of the year, unprepared and caught off guard, was still able to ward off this vicious attack and emerge triumphant and alive. Today, not just in Israel, but around the world, the Jewish people stand tall and stand strong and never again will be the victim. Deserted, isolated, ravaged, and left to wither in agony without a secure and safe harbor to find refuge. And today, each of you, by your presence right here, right now, has said that the Jewish people, each one of us, will never again live in fear. Never again. Gamar Hatimatovah.